Hey folks, thanks for stopping by the Vitality On Show. I'm Dan O'Byrne, the founder and the host, and we're going to talk about habits, metabolic health, lasting fat loss, and minimalism. And today I'm super excited uh, to have a scientist, a world-class guy, who's not only the holder of two PhDs, but he also has been in the trenches training and helping people for 50 years. He's a pioneer in the world of metabolic health and also a man who's very practical and very effective in the real world. That's the kind of thing that Vitality On teaches and I'm super excited to have Dr. Ben Bochicchio. And we're gonna talk about a number of different topics but uh, his 15 minute workout system has been proven to get results to help you lose fat and keep it off and the reason is is our muscles are the metabolic powerhouse of the body and without maintaining muscle mass and strength as we age we are simply going to have more and more problems in fact this is one of the most overlooked aspects of anti-aging is the maintenance of muscle mass there's even a medical science term called sarcopenia which means the loss of muscle mass and if you think about it, if you ever have broken a bone and you put a cast on your arm, as I once did, uh, you, you have that l wasting away of the muscles. And this is what happens to most people year after year after year is they're losing muscle mass, they're losing metabolic power, and they're gaining fat, and they're finding it harder and harder to lose the fat because their metabolic machinery is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So. If this makes sense, I would like to invite you to stick around and let's jump over to our interview with Dr. Ben Bochicchio right now. Dr. Ben, I'm sure you've seen this. They think you need to exercise for hours and hours and hours and, and then you should eat eat less and exercise more and that's and it never works so how does your system and how does your yes, system work? The, the history of that philosophy and the application is evident it doesn't work um, because it's the wrong prescription in the in the beginning of my book i say i write this book because i've seen usually women jogging and it looks like they're working really hard and not having a really good time they're overweight, and I know they went to their doctor and he said, I want you to do more exercise, I want you to cut down on fats, and they're trying like hell to do what he says. It's the wrong prescription, okay? It doesn't work, so they, they get discouraged and they say, exercise and diet doesn't work, I'm gonna give up. I see that and it breaks my heart only because they're wasting energy, they're wasting time. It's the wrong prescription. It's giving them a drug for hemorrhoids and they've got a sore elbow. I mean, you know, it's just, it's not, it's just, and then, which goes to the expression, he doesn't know his ass from his elbow. So that's, you know, basically my thought. If given the right information, I think these plans not only can work, they do work. And for 50 years, I've seen it work across the board universally. And now more than ever, we need productive, efficient, safe behaviors to apply to, you know, combat this metabolic disease. You want to talk about a, a pandemic, talk about metabolic disease. Yeah, yeah. How, how did we get to this point? If we look back at just the, the rates of diabetes and the rates of obesity back in 1970 until now, and it's, you know, it's, it's amazing how, and sad, how many people have, uh, have, are suffering from this, something that could, would you, would you say that that's, that we could reverse a lot of this? Sure. I mean, you don't catch diabetes. You don't catch obesity. These are not, you know, contagious diseases. They are behavioral disorders, okay? And therefore, the logical solution is behavioral. The two most powerful behaviors that we can apply are diet and exercise. I mean, it's that simple. So, yeah, can they be reversed? I mean, you, you look at Dr. Finney's uh, stuff, uh, the, the studies they're doing, um, and they are reversing type two diabetes in 80% of the population in six months through low carb keto diets and some you know, specifically applied exercise. So you know, basically it, it can be done, it is being done. There are random controlled studies now that are being done and, and presented that show that it can be done. Okay, there, there isn't any question that it can be done because it's not 
a genetic disorder in, in most of the cases, it is absolutely behavioral. So when we went and listen, literature for years reinforced the fact that, you know, fat was to be demonized, uh, saturated fat, certainly. And I, you know, having studied this stuff, having reviewed thousands of studies, read, not reviewed, but read and analyzed thousands of studies and read thousands more, you know, was, it was almost indisputable. I said, how can this be? I'm not observing this in my population and my people, but all the literature says it itself. Well, we know now that the literature was skewed, it was biased, and it was really inconclusive. In fact, it was so, what we call equivocal, it was so wacky that the interpretation could be almost considered fraudulent. That's, and that's where we got, and that's where the American Heart Association, American Dietetic Association, you know, jumped on the bandwagon. Of course, the government, which is basically, you know, has the, the, the collective IQ of, uh, of a, a two-year-old, uh, but this is what happened. And it was obviously that something was different. Something was going wrong. And what was going wrong was people were eating too much sugar, too much energy, but mostly in the form of sugar. And the easiest, easiest way to address that, in, in my mind, is to reduce the sugar, the carbohydrate. Although, uh, if, you, if you listen to Dr. Ted Naiman, okay, who I really like as far as his, uh, I don't know if you know T Ted. Yeah, yeah. He, he's uh, a big he, right? he has a, a protein to energy ratio that he talks about. He talks about energy toxicity as opposed to just simply, you know, too many carbs. But in, in, in most cases, in, in my experience, if we can reduce carbs, then we can address this most readily and most palatably because uh, if we reduce carbs, we, we reduce the trigger to the opiate centers in the brain because we know carbohydrates are five times more addictive than cocaine. And, you know, so it goes, there's a bunch of facets to this thing. But if people want to be vegans and eat whole foods, they can do it. Okay, I just think it's more difficult behaviorally. And I think there are some limitations that have to be addressed su with supplements on a, on a vegan kind of diet. But yeah, I'm a low carb guy, I have been for years. And I learned that from the leanest people in the world, because I trained with bodybuilders as a kid. And I said, hell, I have never seen people any leaner than this. And what did they do? They ate protein and a little bit of fat and a little bit of carb, but, you know, and they were lean and healthy. And that's when I started to read about this stuff. And, and re, re, uh, as a result, my best results ever in my, in the world, in, in my history for uh, reducing fat were, were protein sparing modified fast. Now we know they have some complications, but I was leaning that way and have been for years, including fasting. Like I said, my first fasting article that I presented and published was in 1978, okay? And high intensity training I've been doing formally and in studies and in clinical you know, work since 1974. So this stuff is not new. The science doesn't change. Our interpretation of the science changes, uh, but there's so much more information upon which to base a really, you know, uh, a logical and safe application of behavior. Yeah, fantastic stuff. Um, you mentioned the protein sparing fast for, I know there's a lot of people that, that are interested in fasting, they're interested in low carb and in keto. And then we have other people who are probably new to this and they still think it's crazy and they, they are, are thinking we're nuts. And uh, so can you tell us a little bit about any guidelines for the, the protein sparing fast? Well, the protein sparing fast, and I, I'm not, I don't advocate it absolutely, but I mean, the, the, the first one that was real popular was called OptiFast and Oprah Winfrey lost, you know, a hundred or whatever she lost. I year. remember that one in the eight, I uh, used to, I was involved with that in the, in the okay. early so was I. I mean, I developed for Sandow's was the company that manufactured that and that was called OptiFast and I developed an exercise program so, that I cleverly called OptiFit. So in other words, we nice. you want to exercise with this thing. And I, I worked. Believe it. I, I was the guy, I was doing the fitness lectures for that and I, hospital-based wellness center yeah, near yeah. Memphis, Tennessee back in 1990. Yeah, no, I was doing it in the 80s with OptiFat. OptiFat. Anyway, the, the, the point was these people were morbidly obese and right. the downside of protein sparing, protein sparing modified fast is you, you, you ingest protein, very, it, it was a very low calorie diet. I would call it a semi-starvation diet and just protein. So we would try to reduce the, uh, the protein uh, utilization as energy so you wouldn't waste away basically. And so the resting metabolic rate wouldn't go to the, to the sink because we know when you don't eat enough, you go into this starvation mode and you start to use sure. protein as energy. 
you lose muscle. When you lose muscle, resting metabolic rate decreases. When resting metabolic rate decreases, you can eat 700 calories a day and still gain weight if you're hormonally screwed up, which many people that get to that level of obesity are. So in any case, that, that, that's what, but I don't, I don't recommend that as my number one option. Uh, can you do it? In my opinion, I haven't seen really uh, pr many problems. If there are some heart complications and, we, and then we start to get into um, uh, mineral deficiencies and imbalances, that, that's when it has to be done. That's, that's why those things were done under medical supervision and I still think they probably should. So that's my read on that stuff, Dave. So what would be your go-to for the, for the, for someone who's coming to you who's not done anything other than moderate activity and trying to control their caloric intake, maybe they're, you know, the, 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 the idea that uh, they want to get started and with the low hanging fruit, they don't want to change yeah. everything. They want to change a few yeah. simple things. Any suggestions? Yeah. I mean, like I, I said, I'm a minimalist. So what's the least, intrusive behavioral pattern I can apply to get the most bang for my buck. You know, Ivor Cummins speaks about the Pareto principle, which we all know sure. basically defined is 20% of what you do gets you 80% of your benefit. So I, I try to go there. So what you want, what you want to do, most people probably have insulin resistance, which means they, they've been exposed to high levels of sugar intake, and insulin is the hormone that responds to sugar, so it, ha cause it has to regulate it in your blood sugar. And so what happens is as we become more and more inured or um, resistant to insulin, it, we need more of it to drive energy into the cells, primarily into the muscles. So the first thing you can do is to try to diminish the secretion of insulin, okay? How do you do that most readily? You decrease the sugar, <laughs> I mean, carbohydrates. And that's a definition that people are not that aware of. Carbohydrates, what spikes my blood sugar more than birthday cake or brownies, which I don't eat, but uh, is white rice, okay? Sure. So understand what a carbohydrate is. And somehow intelligent people have a, a problem when we say sugar, they don't understand that carbohydrates really are sugars put together in a package. That's, I mean, so cereal. So if you have frosted wheats, frosted mini wheats, Okay, when Tony the Tiger tells your kids it's great, oh, yeah. well, really sugar on sugar. So sure. it's, it's nasty. I mean, it, it raises your the response. And when you're young, it, it doesn't make that much obvious difference. But for example, fasting insulin levels will indicate about 10 years before the manifestation of high blood sugar that you have a problem with metabolic, metabolic handling of that food source of, of the carbohydrate. Okay. So and that's something, for example, doctors should be cognizant of, and they're not measure fasting insulin. It'll tell us way before we have sugar problems. Okay. Cause sugar diabetes is just a proxy for insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it's, it's something that happens after you become insulin resistant by, by a decade. So for example, so what do I tell people? What's okay. Cut your carbohydrates if you can. Okay. And not just cut them that, for all these behaviors, there are thresholds. What is a threshold? It's the point at which when you do a, a, a behavior, something irrevocable and irreversible happens. It's the level at which we want to work in our exercise and which we want to apply in our diet. What's the threshold? For most people under 40 grams of carbohydrate, which when you start to analyze, it seems incredibly drastic, but really that's, that's the threshold that most people see this, the biggest bang for their buck. And it's kind of like Dr. Atkins said, he had a lot of the science right, but people didn't like the messenger, okay? Yeah. But he had a lot of the science right. And so people say, well, I tried Atkins, I lost weight, and then I went off and I gained weight. Well, that's like saying, I tried this medicine, okay? And my rash went away, uh, but I stopped it after three days and my rash came back. Well, you're not taking the medicine anymore. So that's, to me, that's the great, that, great analogy. Yeah. It manifests ignorance. Okay. Well, let's not be ignorant about this stuff. So you have to take this medicine and well, okay. Well, like I can, can I never ever have a piece of pizza or a piece of cake? No, that's ridiculous. Okay. But what you, what you can have are nuts and fish and eggs and poultry and cheese and avocados. And I mean, you can start to make up some, you, you could, I can make you a Cobb salad. Okay. That will just satisfy every taste urge that you had and it's it's plenty healthy and it's low carb so 
Does it take effort? Does it take organization? Yes, it does. In my opinion, the, the most prominent feature of a, a successful diet is organization. I know what I'm going to eat tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I know what I'm going to eat if I go to that restaurant. I know what I'm going to eat if there's a party. Okay. Be organized, be ready. Okay. And not to push my book because I make like, I think two bucks a copy, but um, I have all of this in my book because the reason I wrote the book is because people have asked me these questions for decades. And I said, well, why don't I write the answers down so I don't have to repeat it more than two or 300 times a day? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, well, let's, let's pivot and change gears and, uh, and talk about your book a little bit. And uh, I guess it's, is it on Amazon? Yeah, it's Amazon. It's 15 Minutes to Fitness. And the publishers thought that was catchy. A lot of people like the 15 minute thing. But in reality, 15 minutes is what my average workout for all of my patients and clients, including myself, do. Uh, of high intensity work twice a week. And I explain why that is so and why we've gotten the results that we've gotten uh, for successfully through every population for the last 50 years, because it's good science, okay? It's good science and if you apply it properly, you'll get the biggest bang for your buck. And in addition to the 15 minutes twice a week, I want you to be active, but activity is separate and distinct from exercise. Exercise is formal, it's structured, it's organized, okay? Activity is not being sedentary because as we know, you can exercise and still be sedentary. Sure. If you and I do an, a, an exercise protocol a couple, three times a week, that's great for exercise. If we sit on our butts eight hours a day, we are still sedentary and subject to the cardiac and diabetic risk of being sedentary. So to offset sedentary behavior, we're active, we walk, we stretch, we play golf, we hike. Okay, that's fine. Not absolutely mandatory, critically, every day for a certain number of hours, but suggested and very heavily suggested, the, the high intensity exercise is necessary and mandatory. Yeah, absolutely. And what about, uh, what about cardiovascular training? I, okay. I get that you're, when you're doing the, your, your program, you're probably getting a, du a dual effect. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. Working the muscle as well as working the cardiovascular system? If we understand the term aerobic and what aerobic metabolism is, which is supposed to be good for your heart, and certainly it is, then the work that we do with the SMART system, with this high intensity, is more aerobic than any aerobic workout that you can do. Okay, so it, that gets a little bit into the weeds as far as technically, sure. but long story short, you cannot be more aerobically active than when you are recovering from anaerobic activity. Okay, repeat that. After high intensity exercise, the recovery is almost purely aerobic if we measure what we call the respiratory quotient, again, not to get into the weeds, too, but when we measure what is purely aerobic or how aerobic something is, that respiratory quotient that goes to the purely aerobic is only manifested after recovery from high intensity anaerobic exercise. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And then to, to, to look at cognitive function, I know I've, we've got mm -hmm. a lot of professionals out there that are both both in the healthcare as well as just executives and things like that who would be very interested. Anything they can naturally do to have better cognitive function. And um, I think the term, and I may be butchering this, is brain-derived neurotropic. Yeah, BNDF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, yeah. Okay, so think about this uh, on an evolutionary uh, basis, okay? When does your mind have to be as sharp as possible, okay? When, when do these, neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, dopamine have to be peaked when we are in danger, when we are fleeing or when we're trying to attack and capture food, okay? That is when the muscle system is demanding high level response. Okay. So the brain produces those neurotransmitters at the highest rates during exercise. So there's no question. The best book I've ever read, uh, read about this is called Spark by Dr. John Rattay. R-A-T-A-Y, and he talks about aerobic exercise, and the reason John does that, he's a psychiatrist, and most of the studies that have been done have been on aerobic exercise. However, most people, including well-schooled MDs uh, and exercise physiologists, don't realize that the type of aerobic benefit and the metabolic pathways they're trying to instigate are best instigated by taxing all of the muscle fibers, which means high-intensity training. Okay, so we can duplicate in spades the benefit, the brain benefit, BNDF, uh, neurotropic factors, any of these growth factors, uh, norepinephrine, dopamine are the uh, 
enhanced. Those are neurotransmitters, which makes your, basically makes your brain sharper, work at a higher level, and they diminish with age or with you know, certain diseases like um, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and things like that. So yeah, exercise in the brain is like, I do lectures just on that topic. And so, yeah, well, I can, I can see, I can see you've got it down, down pat. And uh, I think we all, all need to keep our brain health and with the, with the explosion in, in Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, is this, is there, could we, could we cover a little bit of that as far as for those that are like me that have a family member with Alzheimer's uh, that's <clears throat> my radar? So, yeah. you know, along with the ex along with the high intensity exercise, the low fat eating, sorry, the low carb, low yeah. carb eating. I used to be low fat and I used to feel, and I feel a lot better low carb. And anything else you would suggest as far as prevention of? Yeah, yeah of but okay, well, let's go to the diet, okay? Um, we know that what we call amyloid plaque is one of the problems and complications in, Al in Alzheimer's. Amyloid is just the name of the protein, and it, it, it forms plaque if it accumulates. Well, um, th there are, uh, what is the name of that now? Insulin, insulin dependent, insulin degrading enzyme. It's called IDE, okay? The main role of that is to metabolize insulin. However, IDE's secondary function is to metabolize and take and, and reduce, okay, uh, amyloid protein. If we are constantly fighting a high level of insulin, this IDE, insulin degrading enzyme, has no leftover time or power to degrade amyloid plaque. Okay. So if we can take the load off that IDE by reducing insulin response, insulin levels, we can better attack and metabolize the amyloid plaque. That's, and that comes from high intensity exercise or any exercise, but high intensity does it again uh, in, in a magnified kind of a way. All right, so, and if you, if you coupled high intensity exercise with some fasting, would, is there any fasting, evidence? Any, anything that's going to reduce the need for insulin secretion. Intermittent fasting, which in the old days, when it wasn't so scientific, we called eating once a day. Yeah. And, <laughs> and yeah, and, and, and low carb. In other words, whatever induces the down regulation or the reduces insulin secretion will certainly help uh, in rearranging, reversing, preventing some of these complications. Yeah, I mean, fantastic stuff. So it's, so there's just a, just a, plethora of benefits on from from our head to our toes we're doing this this much simpler program that you're advocating take it takes less time it's safer it's sustainable and it's it allows you to get on with your life and and still do other things which is as you as we all know the number one excuse everyone makes is oh i don't have time, time right i don't have time to exercise i don't have time to eat right so i when i'm coaching people i'm always suggesting this too that this is exactly what you're saying there are three reasons why people don't exercise don't have enough time afraid i'm going to get hurt don't see don't see benefits don't, don't see yeah those, right? that's great if you don't have 15 minutes twice a week i can't help you no one has gotten hurt gotten hurt doing this slow resistance training the smart training i'm talking navy seal world-class athletes sedentary people, uh, rehab patients, and most people, honest to goodness, see, see a physical difference in three or four workouts, which is basically about an hour total time in two weeks, because it's powerful medicine, okay? This stuff really works. So you see, so I think we've answered all those questions, and that's why our retention rate is huge. I've got people doing this program for over 40 years, and I have thousands that have been doing it for over 20. So obviously it's sustainable. It's behaviorally palat uh, uh, palatable, okay? You sure. can do this. It, does it take organization? Does it take effort? Absolutely it does. But again, getting the biggest bang for your buck, in my opinion, is something that everybody wants at every level. And that's what we're trying to do. So putting together the high intensity exercise a couple of times a week, uh, because there is this recovery issue, is, is more better? No, it is not. Okay, be active and do your high intensity exercise and then cut down on something of the things that cause what we call energy toxicity of the inability to store 
energy in a healthy manner. And that's cut down, usually cutting down on carbohydrates, but also you can't eat, uh, I, I don't go with the people that say, you can eat as much fat as you want. No, not really, not if you're a big eater. You can't because that energy has to be stored somehow and the liver can't handle all of it. And the same basic concept will happen if we eat too much carb or too much fat. The worst combination on the planet is high fat, high carb. Okay, yes. That's a surefire way to have a catastrophe happen in a very short period of time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, well, before we started recording today, we were chatting and you had an amazing, a simple but powerful analogy for there's as you were, you were, you've seen over the years that a lot of intelligent people with advanced degrees think that complex carbohydrates are somehow safe and they're not, it's not sugar. It's, oh, I don't eat any sugar, but this is the way, and I used to think this way too. And I studied you know, I have a degree in, in, in health science and, and, uh, and I used to think the same thing. It was like, oh, it's a complex carb. It's going to break down slowly. And so I'm okay eating a big plate of pasta and eating a big serving of rice every, you know, every day and et cetera, et cetera, and sports drinks and all this stuff. And uh, luckily I got my insulin tested and was able to, to get some good counsel and, and, uh, you know, changed my planning. But, but can you tell us about that analogy of, uh, you know, of looking at sugar and, and looking at complex carbs and, and how they, and the connection? Well, if, if that's the simple connection you're looking for, I mean, complex carbs do break down <clears throat> less readily and therefore spike insulin less severely. But in the long run, you still have to metabolize the complex carb, which has to break down into glucose, into sugar. Okay, so it does, it, it, it's, it's not, without problems, okay? Uh, and again, for, for example, if you have ingested on a regular basis too much energy, okay? And again, complex car and fat have a lot of energy, so that's true, but fat have, have a higher satiety. Uh, in other words, you get more full eating fat, so there's, a, there's an advantage. And fat doesn't trigger the opiate receptors in your brain that carbohydrates do. So behaviorally, it's much more readily manageable. Okay, but so the complex carbohydrate, again, that, that's the whole thing, you know, well, bread, you know, and or, or whole wheat bread, all these other things, they're fine, and they're less refined than, you know, ref absolutely highly refined products, but they still have to be broken down. And for a diabetic, a piece of stone ground whole wheat bread from the Garden of Eden, or wherever you might get it, will still cause you a problem with carbohydrate and insulin response. So it's not the case. The, 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 the thing, I, I know some diabetics, I know plenty of diabetics, the steel cut uh, oatmeal, which is, you know, great, great complex carb, it spikes their insulin as if they had a plate of brownies. Okay, so please understand, an apple, okay, to a person who's insulin resistant, carbohydrate sensitive, is like eating candy. Unfortunately, that's a tough concept, but it's true because metabolically, chemically, it is the same, it breaks down into the same thing, okay? Glucose, glucose has to be controlled by what? Insulin, insulin is what? Bad, it's a hibernation storage hormone. It tells you not to release energy, okay? Let's stay away from that, okay? <laughs> then please understand insulin. And again, I go over this stuff in my book on a real simple level, but. You have to understand that. This is chemistry. I didn't invent it. I don't sell it. I understand it. And I know how to interpret it for the people's benefits, including my own. And yeah, and, so, and, and for people that don't know you, you, that may, you may, I was really honestly thinking you were much younger, but you're 72 years old. And yeah. uh, so I think that's a testament to, you know, you practice what you preach. And that's, uh, that's good to know. Um, do you think, do you think you're going to, Make it to 100? I, you know, I don't, I don't think about that. Um, um, I just think that I want to, I'm more concerned with health span than lifespan. Sure. And I'm working on a number of projects for that benefit. Yeah, if I'm 100 and I'm drooling into a bucket and I have a blanket over me, I, I'm, I'm not looking forward to that. If I'm 90 and I can still, you know, do my exercise and play golf and, you know, enjoy myself and, and my mind is reasonably sharp, uh, that's cool. So, yeah, I mean, who knows? I mean, that, that, I, I can't think like that. I mean, I, I'm at the age now where I'm at a high risk because of my age for all kinds of stuff. 
but I don't think that metabolically I am, but maybe I'm delusional and that's, you know, that, that's possible. Dr. Ben, speaking of, of risk, can any advice out there for people since it's, we're bombarded by the net with, from CNN and all of the other stations, the constant negative news of the constant crisis news and COVID, and we all know that it's out there and we have to be careful, but what, what advice can we give people who want to, you know, be proactive and, uh, and, and get healthy, not just for this, but for... Okay. I mean, again, the example I give is you see all these athletes that are testing positive for COVID, almost none of them have symptoms and almost none to my knowledge have really serious repercussion. Okay. Why? Because their, their immune system is strong. Okay. If your immune system is strong, you're going to ward off pathogens. You're going to have a reduced negative response. The people that are compromised have metabolic disease, and those people are more likely to die or have serious complications, diabetes, obesity, um, heart disease, things like that. Um, these people are compromised. So you want to keep your immune system strong. And this one factor, again, I, I'd say that this to me is one of the most significant statistical applications I can provide people. 2007, Ruiz and Blair, thousands of subjects, okay? They correlated different factors with longevity. The number one singular correlative to longevity is muscle strength. If you're in the top third for your age and gender and muscle strength, you are 35% less likely to die of cancer and 40% more likely to live to be 100. Not obesity, not diabetes, muscle strength. Why is that? Because if the muscle system is strong, all of the support systems, cardiovascular, cardiorespiratory, hormonal system, nervous system, have to be functioning at a high level to maintain that level of strength. That's a fact. That's a, a landmark study. So stay strong. And we know that now, with, even with Alzheimer's, it's not aerobic exercise, high intensity, muscle strength, uh, muscle training, strength training. Why? Because metabolically, the paths that are generated, the pathways that are generated, are conducive to retaining high levels of health and resisting the degradation of ill health. That's that everybody, we just got our, our money's worth for your <laughs> admission price right there. That's, that's so vitally important. So um, please share this out there. Listen to this, share this with your doctor, share this with your favorite health practitioner. And uh, that's, that's awesome to know. So, Dr. Ben, I, I, don't, I want to be respectful of your time. I know you've got a workout waiting for you, and uh, I've got to get my son in the bathtub pretty soon. He's four years old, although he looks like he's, he looks like he's five or six. I'm, I'm afraid when he gets 10, he's going to be bigger than me. <laughs> so, any, any, any parting ideas or, or anything that – I'm just looking over my notes here. We, we rapidly covered most of what we, we've talked about before. and. Um, and added new things and well here's one I, I could throw in there just for just as a colorful note uh, I know you you worked with um, a lot of you know some Hollywood people and some athletes and and had, and people like Arthur like Arthur Jones who created Nautilus and can you share any anecdote from all of your years with with uh, that would uh, about from behind the scenes, anything about anyone you worked with, you know, not to violate anyone's privacy, but just something that something funny, something funny about that. Well, I, I can tell you, I can impart some wisdom, and it, it's a little parable that Arthur told me. Uh, and I say, you know, Arthur, this uh, this stuff is so good and so beneficial. Why don't more people do it? Why don't more people use a low carb or hydrate approach or high intensity exercise? He told me a story about an old man at the side of a road, dirt road. You're passing by and he's got a big pile of dirt next to him and his knees are bleeding and his fingers are bleeding because he's digging this hole with his fingers, okay? So he said, you walk to your trunk of your car and you take a pick and a shovel out, brand new, and you give it to the guy and you think you are his savior. And you walk back to your car and he hits you over the back of the head with the shovel. So what happened? Well, what, what he's done is he's shown this guy the error of his ways and how much time he's wasted and he can't handle it. So when we're trying to change behaviors of people, why are they resistant? Because they've been digging the hole with their fingers. We give them a better tool, they don't want to accept that. It's hard for people to change something they've had so much investment in with regard to time and behavior. So understand, try to be open-minded, try to understand that there could be a better way 
and hopefully it'll help you live a healthier, happier, you know, more pleasant life. That's a beautiful story. Thank you for for remembering that and sharing that. And that's from that's from many. How long ago did Arthur Jones tell you that story? Oh God, uh, fifty years ago, almost fifty. Wow. Well, there. Well, you can see your mind and your memory are functioning well, sir. So I, uh, <laughs> I, I want to keep, and you've got 20 years on me, and uh, so I want to be where you are. So, so that's, this, is, this has been amazing. So, Dr. Ben, um, I want to just once again, thanks so much for your time. I think this is a good point to, uh, to wrap it up. And um, for anyone out there who wants to, uh, to find Dr. Ben online, we're going to put everything in the show notes. Here, this will be in our, on YouTube as well as it'll be on our Instagram, our Twitter, our Facebook, and uh, we'll get it out to the world. No, I appreciate it. Now, everybody stay well. Yeah, absolutely. And have a great workout. What, what's that? You're going to go from largest muscle groups to the smallest? Yes, I, do the, I do the same exact workout that's in my, in my book, and I haven't changed my workout for 50 years. The people ask me how come. I said because I have the same muscles with the same functions I had 50 years ago, and it's working. So. I'm, I'm there doing it. Uh, awesome. Fantastic. Well, once again, hats off and thank you so much, sir. We'll be, uh, we'll be in touch and, I'll, and uh, look forward to, to, staying, to talking more in the future. All right. Well, stay well. I thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Okay, you too. Thank you. Okay.